And with that, we are going to move into some project updates. First off will be Richard to talk about Prometheus. Thank you. Um, we are five minutes ahead of schedule. So for the AV people, should we just keep going or should we actually? Okay, good. Good. So, hi again. Uh, you'll see all three of us once more um, <laughs> for the project updates. Uh, so let's talk updates. Um, first, one thing on growth. And again, uh, if you're in the room, uh, in, in the audience, please don't talk because it's really, really loud up here. It's not your fault that it's loud up here, but please keep it quiet. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, this is the, the growth over the years of Prometheus, and the um, the important part here is this is the best numbers which we as a Prometheus project have. Um, Grafana makes them public once a year um, for during PromCon, so these are pretty fresh. They're from last month. Um, the thing is, we only see data sources. We don't see actual installations. So this is the absolute rock bottom baseline of active installations. Um, it's definitely more from from guesses which CNCF and Linux Foundation gave us, uh, it's more in the millions to tens of millions. Um, we are by now the 95, 91st most start GitHub organization uh, worldwide. Um, Kubernetes is 27th. Uh, and the 161th most start repository on GitHub, Kubernetes being 40th. Um, second basically uh, for, for all of CNCF and pretty much all of the observability things, except Grafana that's higher. So let's go into, into updates on Prometheus. So first and foremost, we now really have native histograms. Um, they really actually work. And while previously histograms already worked nicely within Prometheus, you were kind of forced to know what you're doing to be really able to leverage them really effectively. And the thing is, this often meant the cycle of figuring out stuff, like what is the actual behavior, and then only choosing proper cutoffs or proper buckets for your histograms and then getting the maximum uh, value out of your thing, um, which works, but it's not the, the, uh, the perfect experience which you, which you would be looking for. Uh, with native histograms, the short version is everything just make, happens as if by magic. Um, just enable them and you'll, you'll see actual high resolution things. High enough resolution that you can do things like this if you so choose, or obviously also this. Um, other things, memory usage. Um, Brian, he's here, will also uh, give a talk about this um, later today. Um, if you are running uh, anything older than 2.44, you basically want to upgrade right now or after this talk, because uh, you will literally half your, uh, your memory usage, in particular if you have any large uh, Prometheus instances. This substantial. Uh, again, as to the details, Brian is going to talk about this later. We have a quite nice quality of life improvement for you. Um, there's something called Keep Firing 4, which you can put into your alerts. It's not yet a full hysteresis, but what you can do is when your alert is basically at the edge of your alerting condition, you don't stop the uh, the alert and then refire it 30 seconds later or whatever. You can actually maintain this for some time. Also, in, in case you have a fluctuation, it's a little bit more convenient because things don't go away while you try looking at them. So th if you haven't played with this, I highly encourage you to, um, to put this to basically a few minutes and see how you like it. We now allow you to... Um, to actually build your configuration from an abundance of independent files. I am probably not the only person who has done this basically through shell scripts for basically 2015, I think, in my case, um, like forever. Um, but the thing is, now this is actually a first-class feature. So you can actually start building your configuration from distinct blocks, which just makes a lot of automation easier. It also allows you to have a little bit of a common theme in your different instances, and then maybe have a special one on your own laptop because you need that one other thing or whatever. It's just much more malleable and more of a building block thing for your, um, for your config files. 
On Open Metrics, uh, Open Metrics will officially join Prometheus. Some of you will be absolutely thrilled. Some of you don't even know what that means. That's fine. Um, in CNCF speak, the um, the Open Metrics project will be uh, deprecating itself, and then the assets of it will be joining the Prometheus project, similar to what Open Tracing and Open Census did to form Open Telemetry. Speaking of open telemetry, um, there is now an experimental uh, OTLP receiver in, uh, in Prometheus. Uh, while push is still not the recommended way to get stuff into your Prometheus, and it never will for reasons which we can uh, discuss and defend over a beer, uh, the thing is still, um, the fact is that a lot of people want to, uh, to directly send OTLB data into their Prometheus instances, and they now can. On the alert manager, I apparently didn't copy things properly. So for the alert manager, we will have a completely new React-based UI. Uh, we are also, same as with everything else, looking for maintainers all of the time. Because while we have the second largest installation in all of, uh, in all of CNCF, um, we have like 12 active maintainers. Um, so more hands is always better. And if, if you want to get involved and if you want to maybe at some point become a maintainer or a team member, please reach out. And if you speak React, that would be a nice, well-scoped thing to, to, get work, uh, to get started on. For SNMP Experter, we have a breaking change, which is a good thing in this case. Um, of course, you can now split out your auth block. Again, this is one of those things. If you don't know what this means, you don't care and you don't have to care. If you know what this means, this is massively going to improve your life. It's, it's one of those things. Uh, the short version is basically you're now able to, to, again, have a more malleable configuration of your complete Prometheus installation and be able to have building blocks to actually make a more specific configuration out of more generic bits and pieces, which just, again, uh, reduces the total amount of config lines by sometimes orders of magnitude. The Windows exporter has become an official exporter. This took ages uh, for licensing reasons, um, and we're pretty much there by now. Um, yeah, this is one of those things which happen silently in the background, and lawyers get involved, and other people get involved, and it's just thankless work. And once you're done, it's basically as if it had never existed, but it was super important, and now we, we can actually have a proper first-class Windows exporter as part of the Prometheus project. My SQL D exporter now supports multiple targets. So if you have been using, I mean, pretty much everyone is using Prometheus will probably be using Blackbox exporter, um, but also things like SNMP exporter, Modbox, Modbox exporter, IPM, IPMI exporter, Prusa exporter, all of those are also basically reverse proxies. I mean, these, this is what exporters are general, but they're not tied to a specific instance of MySQL anymore. You can now just have one instance and query 10 dozen different MySQL servers if you so choose, which also obviously means you can use this for, the SQL, uh, for SQL if you, if you want, because it's compatible with any SQL server, basically. The Java client is now stable. It's 1.0. Um, it has a very nice extra feature where it allows you to, uh, to send, if you so choose, completely native OTLP. Um, but you still, you get to use the APIs of, uh, of the Prometheus client library, which basically means you have to write a lot less code. So that's nice. And also it supports native histograms. So what's coming? Ah, there's the alert manager UI. Okay, sorry, I forgot to copy this over properly. Um, we also will have a bunch of metadata improvements. Um, you will finally be able to deduce what the metric type is. This might also, or this will allow us to do more magic on this is a counter, and we can actually prove that this is a counter, not just deduce it from the name. So you can automatically put a rate on this, and all of those synthetic sugars and, and quality of life improvements are just easier to do. Um, the created timestamp will, will be redone also as a metadata because underscore created is nice and it's quite useful for a few use cases, but in the worst case, it doubles your, your metric uh, load uh, or metric cardinality, and that's not awesome. So we are putting this into metadata, and they're actually going to be persisted in, in the TSDB. So it's not the case anymore that you basically have all of this in RAM, and once you restart your instance, this is gone. Some backends already could do this, but now Prometheus is also going to be able to do this. Exemplar improvements, uh, in case you don't know what exemplars are, those are basically just IDs which you can attach to metrics or to logs and they point directly to a trace, which means 
this is a high latency bucket. I know this is a high latency uh, execution and can I jump directly into a trace and know that this is high latency and don't have to self onboard or even have this needle and haystack problem of trying to find the, the relevant traces. Um, and this is also going to be uh, persistent in TSB and retained in recording rules. And we are going to overhaul um, the remote write v2, basically making it much more efficient. It will become uh, stateful, um, but it will reduce bandwidth method massively. And if you still want to have stateless, you can still use the old, the old style. We are not removing this. One final thing. Um, we are working toward a Prometheus 3.0. We are going to be very, very careful with, uh, with the breaking changes. Uh, there will probably be a few, um, but maybe there won't, but it will be big enough to actually be a, a, a major version release. So if you have any big audacious goals which you always wanted to have in Prometheus and ideally are willing to also invest some of your time into this, now is a really good time to, to get involved because um, this is going to be a substantial jump. And with this, over to Eduardo, who, ah, there he is. Good morning again. How are you? Good. It's Monday. Well, my name is Eduardo Silva. I'm one of the FluentD maintainers, a creator of FluentD, FluentBit, and founder, and actually wearing a CEO hat. But the most important thing here is like I'm going to deliver the Fluent updates. Uh, the project FluentD was created around 2011. And in 2011, the vision was around how to solve logging at a massive scale where you have this common problem of multiple data sources with multiple formats and, and where as a side effect, it gets really hard to understand and analyze data. And now, if you look forward, after more than 12, 13 years, you will find that the problem is bigger. Now we have distributed systems, we are deploying microservices, and this is really messy. FluentD was donated to the CNCF around 2016, and now it's a graduated project, uh, same as FluentBit, which was, was a small brother, but I would like to call it today the next generation project because there are many reasons around performance and how do we envision everything that is telemetry data, not just logs today. We're looking at logs, metrics, and traces, and how to do also processing around when creating these data pipelines inside um, this solution. What Fluent does pretty much connects multiple sources, multiple destinations, but in the middle, you can do a lot of processing. Processing means if you're in metrics, add labels, remove labels. If you're in logs, enrichment, data enrichment, and all things that you can think are possible. The way that we see Fluent, I know that you were thinking this, is not a drop-in replacement for anything. One of the biggest bad assumptions when using technology is that we are always looking for the new thing. Oh, this is going to replace this. But when you go to production and you go to the companies, Nobody is looking forward to replace everything because I'm sure most of you are operators. You don't want to replace everything in one day to the other. Things take time. What you need to do is to integrate, right? If you are using syslog and you want to move to open telemetry, you're not going to rewrite your applications that you wrote maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, right? You're going to do, to, we're going to try to find this channel for conversion. In Fluent Ecosystem, we integrate with Prometheus, with open telemetry, we do open metrics, and with everything that you can imagine from a telemetry um, perspective. Where is Fluent? Fluent is used by all the major cloud providers. Oracle just jumping into the boat, but today uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Oracle deploys Fluent Bit heavily. If you go to GKE and you just deploy, uh, I don't know, Kubernetes cluster in Google, you will find that Kubernetes is running on every single node. And this is just a small and maybe outdated photo of who used this technology. And today we are achieving 10.9 billion downloads. I didn't want to put 11, but this is crazy. This is crazy because that means that more companies are moving their workloads to containers. I'm not talking about Fluent. First, you deploy the applications. Once you deploy, you need to monitor. And then you go with the default stack. 
And, and Fluent Bit has been in the de facto in the latest month. I think that I would say 80% of this number has been in the last 18 months. It's crazy. And so I appreciate uh, this effort from the developers, maintainers, and also thank you the community for this uh, accomplishment. And what we are announcing today, today we are tagging, we are tagging means like in a couple of hours, the next version of Fluent Bit that is called Fluent Bit 2.2, and I want to deliver the updates about this. Fluent Bit from an architecture in perspective, what allows you is to create a data pipeline or a telemetry pipeline where you can handle logs, metrics, and traces. And as I said at the beginning, you have all the capabilities to connect to different sources, different destinations, and with the ability to filter out data, meaning enrich it, transform it. For example, if you have a log, you want to sometimes remove some keys or add some new keys, right? But here you can say that step one, you have the input plugins, the collectors, you can we have the new concept of processors that can be attached to the, to the input plugins. We're going to dive more into that into the next technical session this week in KubeCon. But as you can see, you can connect the data from one input to multiple outputs and segment different type of logics for processing. Yeah, and you might be asking, hey, why do I need to do processing in the output connectors? And there are different really interesting use cases. Uh, everybody's trying to, for example, optimize in cost. Right, but who's a Splunk user? Please raise your hand here. Oh, it's like, uh, yeah, I am. No, and, and <laughs> no, be proud of your technology. Just fix how you're using it, right? So the, the thing is that one of the major um, complexities with these technologies is like there's a dependency to send all the data to these packets. But in reality, you're not using, you're not taking the best of that data in that way. Actually, there are different ways to optimize. For example, everybody choose a more cheaper storage for your data, like S3. You send everything to the S3. You don't process the data. But if you're going to send the same data to Splunk, maybe you're just going to remove a couple of keys that you are not interested in. You're going to get all the value from Splunk, all the analytics, but with the most cheapest cost. And now. Uh, continue with updates. Uh, we just shipped a new filter and processor, which is called SysInfo. We found that all users, when collect their logs, uh, they like to attach the host name, you know, the operating system, the Linux kernel version, and, and so on. So we just wrote a simple filter and processor that automatically attach this information for you when the data gets processed through the pipeline. Also, um, I mentioned that Fluentbit is able to collect metrics from different places, right? One of them is from Docker containers. So if you're using Docker technology and Docker stored relevant information in the, in the file system, right, in this file system, and the way that this information is stored, for example, for metrics, is by using the Cgroups v1 API or, or v2. So in the past, well, uh, as of a couple of months, we only supported a v1 if you were using Docker. If you use Podman, yeah, in Podman we support both. So this is kind of just bringing in parity to uh, the development of these connectors. So if you want to extract Docker container metrics today in a Linux box, yeah, you can use it with Fluentbit and will auto handle everything if it's running Cgroups one versus two behind the scenes. What you have in the left that is called classic format is the configuration format that Fluentbit use that uh, we started, hey, let's create our own configuration format, right? And we ended up with something that it doesn't look like anything, and sometimes adds a lot of complexity, right? Because it's strict an indentation. If you want to have two levels of indentation for different configurations to make it more readable, it gets really complex. So this year, we launched a new YAML configuration format that runs at the same time that the classic format. So you can use both if you want, even mix it, right, in different files. And with the new YAML format, we're trying to, to have the concept of a pipeline, the inputs, the outputs, and now it gets more easy. Easy, for example, if you're deploying Fluentbit at scale and you have your own uh, tooling to manage configuration with YAML, so now you can take advantage of your tool and have a better experience uh, with Fluent. 
Now, talking about metrics, uh, and I always say this story a couple of years ago, users were asking, hey, we have, I have this problem. I have multiple agents on my machine. I have Fluent for logs. I have Prometheus not exported for metrics. And I have, I don't know, 10 more agents. And this is called the agents fatigue. And now we got the, the idea, hey, if Fluent Bit is so versatile, they have a pluggable architecture, why you don't provide an, a plugin to collect metrics, same as Prometheus Node Exporter, right? So the Fluent team, what we did, we took Prometheus Node Exported and did a copy paste from Golang to C, to be very honest. And in C, we replicate the same metrics, the same dimensions, and everything. So now you can get rid of one agent in your environment. This is not fluent against Prometheus. Actually, we have a really good relationship with the Prometheus team. And the goal is to provide a more unified experience for the end user. And now we just ship um, processor metrics. So for all processors that you have in your machine, if you want, you can scrape all the metrics for it. Uh, we just ship also a new exporter inside the same agent for Mac OS. You might imagine why we want to monitor Mac OS, but there are a couple of users who are shipping, how, how to call it, tools for the employees that they can monitor the metrics of their, their laptop. So they collect CPU, they start memory, and so on. And our loved operating system, Windows, right? For Windows also, we just ship another collector. And this collector collects CPU, thermal zone, logical disk, and everything that you need from this type of environments. Um, some time ago, we integrated with Grafana Loki, but the Grafana team uh, used to contribute back to Fluentbit with a goal and connector for Loki. Right? One of the downsides of having an external plugin as a connector is that it's really hard to assemble a final image for your own environment because you have what is flow embed, then you had two layers of, if you're using containers, right, you had to bring the other plugin, and sometimes really hard to be updated. But at the same time, the Fluent team started creating a native Loki connector. And now in Grafana, in Grafana Loki, the, the Golan plugin is being deprecated in favor of the new one because we just bring this parity, uh, which took a couple of, like a year. So if you are a Loki user, you can use, still use the Golan plugin, but looking forward, we want to use the native integration. Another chip that we have in Fluentbed, uh, we just ship the connector to retrieve Kubernetes events. Kubernetes events is all events that have in the Kubernetes cluster that you can use for security purposes you know, or to do some audits or to understand what's happening inside your cluster, right? So Fluentbed also has a native connector for that. And the biggest one is the performance improvement. We always like to talk about performance because one of the problems is like when you deal with telemetry data, if your agent, your tool, or your solution is not fast enough, easily that tool can consume a lot of resources in your node. And one thing that you don't want is that that tool consume a lot of um, CPU and memory. And Fluentbit is very lightweight. So while well, we did an improvement, so when you collect data and then you send the data and you do filtering in the middle, we come up with a solution for a six times improvement in performance. Less CPU, less memory, and all of this, you will understand that uh, this is a huge win for any type of environment. People don't use one filter. Sometimes they use 10, 15, because they have different business logic, and this is the biggest uh, improvement. And a community update, um, we have one community member, Phil Wilkins, who wrote a FluentD book. And if I'm not wrong, he works for Oracle, external, not affiliated with Caliptia or with Fluent directly. And he started writing the FluentD book, and now he's writing the Fluentbit book. So I was asked to have this slide with a QR code. So if you want to get access to the book for free, now is your time to take your phone, scan the QR code. And if you want, fill the form, and you will get a copy of the early access to this book. The way that Manning works is like you get access to the first chapters, and they will notify you after a couple of one month, every two months, hey, there's a new chapter available, so you can consume the book right, uh, over time. And the final release date is for the next year. And we are trying uh, to align the stars here with Fluentbit 3.0 that will be out the next year uh, around KubeCon in Paris. So a lot of things are happening in the Fluent ecosystem around um, adoption, 
increasing integration, performance, and now uh, I think that the next part is content. Well, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Austin to talk about open telemetry updates. Thank you. Hello again. Um, yeah, so Austin Parker, Director of Open Source at Honeycomb, and recently elected member of Open Telemetry Governance. If you voted for me, thanks. <clears throat> so, Open Telemetry has had, again, a very busy year, very exciting year. And I want to kind of go through some highlights of what we're really talking about this week at KubeCon. Um, it's important to remember that Open Telemetry is a huge project. Right, like it is gone from being, quite frankly, you know, a dream that about 10, 20 people had five, six years ago, and expanded into being the second highest velocity project in the CNCF and measured by the CNCF. Um, it's almost as big as Kubernetes in terms of activity, contributions, committers, PRs, all that. It spans dozens of languages hundreds of frameworks and libraries and integrations, and we're starting to see huge uptake um, of open telemetry outside of the project, where many, many third-party projects now, um, commercial products, are adopting open telemetry as their choice for a standard for um, observability telemetry data. So what's new? Logging is now generally available in the spec. Logging is done. It is stable. We are not changing anymore. Um, it's in Java and .NET. It's GA. Other languages very soon. It's experimental in JavaScript. A few others. Python is pretty close. Yeah. So with logging being done, that's all three things, right? That's metrics, tracing, and logging. How exciting. Earlier this year, we announced that we are aligning our semantic conventions with the Elastic Common Schema to further reduce the number of standards and to further um, establish open telemetry as you know, the single best way to express observability telemetry. Uh, on this note, we just announced this morning, I just saw the PR go through, HTTP semantic conventions are now stable. Yeah, if you know, you know. Again, we're reducing the number of duplicative standards. We're just we're trying to you know make this easier, right? For too long, every every single observability stack looks very vertically integrated, and it winds up with a lot of duplicative effort, right? Like I love my other observability friends in the CNCF, but you know we just talked about how FluentBit is going to let you do stuff that Prometheus does, that OpenSolidity does, that all this stuff does. It's Having that standard means less work for everyone, and it also means that we can all pile in on sort of that unified base layer, right? And this alignment with Elastic Common Schema does that and also helps move open telemetry towards supporting security use cases. Another big thing from earlier this year is OTLP is 1.0. Um, this has been why we're seeing more and more uptake of open telemetry as a protocol for you know, transmitting this data back and forth. Um, we're seeing this in the hardware sector, right? In telecom, in IoT, GPUs. There's plugins to, you know, get this stuff out of NVIDIA GPUs so that if you're doing wild, you know, ML model training, you can emit those metrics in open telemetry format. And <clears throat> again, this unlocks a ton of value for you as both a developer, as an operator, wherever you sit, by not having to kind of rely on these highly specialized vertically integrated tool sets anymore. And as I mentioned, you know, it's the second highest velocity project for the second or third year in a row now, and it shows no signs of slowing down. We have an all-time high in contributors and contributing organizations. Um, we have, on a quarterly basis, almost 1,000 contributors. Um, we have about 2,000 organizations represented for the year. Another important thing that happened this year is that Open Census was deprecated. Now, I want people to think back to um, a couple years ago, several years ago, before the pandemic. There was a KubeCon in San Diego. Anyone, was anyone there? A couple of y'all? Who had heard of Open Telemetry in 2019? Did you hear about Open Telemetry through a blog post that looked that had this section in it? This was our initial 
um, plan that we published on the open tracing and open census blogs. And these were our major milestones in 2019. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure it's not 2019 anymore, everyone. But if you go through this and you look at what we've accomplished, right? We have, we, we have done our reference candidates. We have formed teams. We have formed so many teams. We have, again, thousands of contributors every month from dozens of companies, both people that are competitors in the observability space, um, end users that are building, you know, at all sizes of organization and all levels of sophistication, you know, people that are actually using this in anger every day, and God bless you for it. And they are contributing back. They are making this better for all of us. We did officially launch the project at KubeCon Barcelona. We do have these major languages having parity with open tracing and open census. We have officially sunset open tracing and open census now and deprecated them, which means we're a couple years late, but it's time to officially celebrate that we have achieved our original goals as a project. We have merged open tracing and open census successfully. We have replicated its functionality. Y'all did it. Give yourself a hand. This is honestly, like, really, really exciting, right? Like, how many, who's heard of Open Telemetry now? Most of you, I would hope. We've gone from 20 people sitting on a Zoom call. Um, a lot of people aren't where they started anymore. Some people have left the project. Some people have come on to it, you know? And if you had asked me in 2018 when I was getting into Twitter fights um, with Open Census maintainers about like what people should pick to use as the telemetry standard for their project, I could never have guessed that I would be up here today, you know, announcing this achievement. So if you are a contributor or a maintainer, actually, yeah, if you're a contributor or a maintainer, can you stand up, let everyone, come on, I see y'all. Hotel, get up, give them, a, give them a round of applause. We would not be here without all of you. And we wouldn't be out here without everyone that has used the project, everyone that has made a PR, everyone that has filed an issue, everyone that has adopted this. Again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. We'll talk more this week about the future at our various project meetings and at our various um, things on the show floor. So this year we have what's called the Open Telemetry Observatory. This is going to be on the show floor. It's a little lounge area. Thanks to our friends at Splunk for sponsoring that. We'll also be at the um, booth in our project pavilion. So please come by, meet with your SIGs, meet the maintainers, um, get to know each other. We would really, really, really love more contributors, more maintainers in the project. Um, there is room for everything and anything. If you do front end work, you do back end work, Go, Elixir, Rust, whatever, like there is a home for you in open telemetry. Um, please come find someone that is a maintainer or uh, find me and I will plug you in to those conversations. We would love to have you. And with that, and come to Contrib Fest. Yes, when's Contrib Fest again? Wednesday? So Wednesday there'll be a Contrib Fest that's Python and JavaScript? Collector and JavaScript, so go and JS. You can come and uh, actually make some contributions and learn how to get plugged in. So please see Jirasi for more information. And Alex, right there. And Anthony, right there. Find any open telemetry person and they will uh, tell you about it. All right.